Yali Madad, and welcome everyone. My name is Marine Rajabali, and I am the current regional chairperson for the Conciliation and Arbitration Board for the Midwestern United States. Today, I will be moderating the topic, which is Strengthening Relationships During the Age of COVID-19, a guide for couples. This webinar is a collaboration between the Social Welfare Board and the Conciliation and Arbitration Board, also known as CAB. I'd also like to take this time to let you know that next week, CAB will be hosting a webinar on the topic of interpersonal communication in our new normal, effective everyday strategies for conflict resolution. It will be held on Thursday, April 23rd at 8.30 p.m. Central. Social Welfare Board will also be hosting a webinar in two weeks on the topic of caretaker stress and caring for our elderly which is set to be held on Sunday, May 3rd at 2.30 p.m. Central. As for today's topic, we will begin with a moderated discussion for 40 minutes, which will be followed by a question and answer session. Myself and the panelists will also be summarizing the answers in Urdu as we go through the webinar. Please feel free to ask your questions. And the way you can do that is by entering your questions in the questions box as you see on the screen. And I wanna encourage you to go ahead and ask your questions for our panelists. We have here expert panelists to, to, to be able to provide you with resources that can be valuable for your benefit. Agar aapke paas koi bhi sawal ho, aap please puche. Hum har koshish karenge ke har ek sawal ka jawab de sake. Also note that if you are viewing from a cell phone, you can swipe right or left to view the webinar or the video or the speakers. So let's go ahead and get started. Today's discussion, we're featuring two expert panelists, Dr. Sheza Juma, who is the Mental Health Portfolio Member for the National Social Welfare Board. And we also have Samreen Patel, who is a marriage and family therapist. Thank you to both of you for being with us today. Hi everyone, Yali Mehta, thank you for joining. We're very excited for a great discussion. It's so nice to be with you both and all the couples and partners who are joining us. Thank you so much. Yeah. Shazad and Samreen will today speak to us about how the COVID-19 pandemic has presented so many new stresses on relationships and also added challenges for securing marital harmony. It's been real tough, especially with such drastic and unexpected changes in circumstances it can be difficult to prioritize your own relationship. So today, there, our experts will highlight the current and future challenges that couples may face and also present tools that can be used to cope with stress and resolve conflict between yourselves. We hope that you will leave with strategies to help enhance and strengthen the relationships for yourselves and your families. Today's topic is about ko mazboot karne ke bare mein hai. Dr. Sheza Juma or Samreen Patel kaafi resources present karenge jo aap apne gharon mein istemal kar sake. So we'll go ahead and begin with our first question. So Samreen, let's talk a little bit about how couples should begin to talk about their opinions of the virus itself. Thanks, Marine. That's an excellent question. Um, given the influx of information we receive daily surrounding COVID-19, it could quickly become overwhelming on exactly what to focus on individually as a couple and ultimately as a family unit, right? So really recognizing and knowing each other's thoughts, beliefs, opinions about the virus itself and how they may really differ. So naturally, one partner may want to take more precautions as opposed to the other. So there may be some changes in rules about cleanliness, going out when you are receiving your groceries or any other packages, what would that look like in terms of cleanliness? And then of course, knowing where your partner stands and seeking to understand their views out loud. There are no assumptions here. So go ahead and communicate exactly how you feel about the precautions you both need to take and understand that this is an ever evolving time. So compromise based on prioritizing safety first. Um, and of course, come up with an agreed upon plan. 
when you're compromising, um, it, it's really critical to keep something that's, that's going to relatively satisfy both parties and always, always prioritizing safety. Um, last but not least, decide on how much news to take in and from what sources. Um, I know we're getting lots and lots of news, not only from our WhatsApp groups, social media, and different news sources, really recognizing what is a credible news source and how much we should take in. And try to take a break from news, um, not only for your sake, but for the sake of your family, right? One tip we would like our couples and our families to take away today is at least one day a week take a day where you're not reading any news, where you're not turning on any news on the TV and make it a pleasurable activity for couples. So whether it's cooking, I don't know, cleaning is pleasurable, maybe you can make it more pleasurable, um, going out for a walk, but really do one day that is news free. So as um, Samreen said, couples ke darmiyan aisa bhi ho sakta hai ke ek jana zyada cautious ho aur dusra kam cautious. इस सिचुएशन में अपने थॉट्स को वॉइस करें और साथ मिलकर प्लान बनाएं। न्यूज़ में भी आजकल बहुत सारी चीजें सुनने में आ रही है इंफॉर्मेशन सब जगह है लेकिन ये अहम है कि आप अपने आप को एक मेंटल ब्रेक दें जैसे हफ्ते में एक दिन न्यूज जरा भी ना देखें और इंस्टेड अपने पार्टनर के साथ कुछ फन प्लान करें as couples, what kind of an approach and attitude should they have during this time, Shazad? Great question. Um, it's a great question because attitude and mindset are so important. What we know from the research is that how we think about something affects how we feel. So if we're thinking, oh my gosh, it's going to be a tough couple of weeks, this is going to be awful. And if we keep saying those messages to ourselves, then we're probably going to feel pretty worried, pretty upset, pretty nervous. So we have to think about things we can tell ourselves and tell our partners to help uh, the situation. Things like, we're going to get this, through this together, or all we have to do is think of one day at a time, or this is only temporary. Or for some couples, this is an opportunity for us to serve. Things like that will really be a good idea to come back to as a couple. I'll also say that having an attitude um, of gratitude, really, and reminding each other what you're thankful for will go a long way. The research on gratitude is very good. And thinking about, even through these tough times, what you're thankful for, what you do have, um, is a great great place to start. I'll also say that during this time, stresses might be pretty natural and an extra effort from each partner to forgive and let things go would be good. So resist the impulses to point out flaws during this time, hold your breath a little bit more, try to show a little bit more compassion um, and it'll go a long way. I'll also say having a solutions focused mindset so when you do talk about big decisions or, or um, struggles, I would say, think about how you can talk in a way that'll, that, that you're actually both coming to solution, both for yourself and your family. And lastly, what I'll say is it's all really easy to say these things, but the challenge is putting this mindset into regular practice. So decide as a couple how you want to keep these beliefs at the forefront. Will you share what you're grateful for every night at dinner? Will you put post-its and reminders throughout the house? Um, doing things like the, this um, will be good to decide. And so our tip for this category is for you to choose as a couple three statements or three mindsets that can help you get through this time and making a plan for remembering or reminding your partner about them. Just as Shehzad has told you, in such a situation, every person has to think that these situations are positive or negative. If we think that this will never be finished, then our thoughts will affect our attitude and our attitude will be negative. Our attitude will be negative. 
इंस्टेड एक दूसरे को याद दिलाते रहे कि ये टाइम पास होगा और थोड़ा एक्स्ट्रा एफर्ट फॉर गिवनेस पर दे छोटी छोटी बातों को भी जाने दे so for many people you know roles and responsibilities have also drastically changed for example in some ways there's so much to do for many people and for others there's not enough to do so i'll ask both of you this question where should couples start couples kaha shuru kare when it comes to defining zimmedariya between themselves great question and it is so normal as you said marian that during this time roles might have to shift and that might be especially tough for some families some traditional families the fact is that one partner might have a lot less to do and might be at home more uh, especially if that partner was working every day and one partner might actually if they were the ones doing more child care or uh, taking care of the house more they might find that there's a lot more to do because the house is more lived in so my advice is talk about what things have to shift and who has extra space and time and share the load this is the time to use kids to use grandparents um to do chores to help with the house so that everybody feels really involved and like they're um all putting their efforts towards the greater cause so as a, a couple decide how to shift and who those responsibilities can go on so that everybody uh has an equal load absolutely i loved your point about partnership and to add to your point shazad i would like to highlight the importance of planning planning at any time is important but it becomes even more critical in a challenging time like now right so develop flexible plans and discuss them regularly and really check in with yourself um along with your partner to see how well the plans are working and if there are any rooms for enhancements to occur for the plans to work better there are some key areas where especially in a time like this planning becomes critical and those are housework finances and children So as Shahzad mentioned when you are looking at housework and chores some traditional gender roles may no longer operate for your family dynamic given that one person who was working outside and the other person was taking care of those household responsibilities will no longer be the case right so if both parties are home what does that really look like now um if you do have your nana nannies your dada dadis your uncles your aunts your cousins involved having those conversations about what would that look like as it relates to housework another category where a plan of action is critical is finances i understand finances is a very challenging and difficult topic in general but right now given the times that we're in and people being laid off and just finances may not be the right topic to talk about but it is very critical and we'll be discussing this later in the webinar as well and last but not least definitely discuss child care right if both parties were previously working but you're not anymore so what does child care look like if you live with extended family utilize those resources right so bring in your grandparents or your children's grandparents the in-laws and really focus on how both of you can operate with these plans of actions daily by checking in with each other but definitely have a plan of action surrounding every single thing you're doing right now so you're more in a proactive state as opposed to a reactive state. Shahzad, do you have any tips on how couples can check in daily? Just a really simple tip. I would tell all couples to add these two questions to your daily dialogue. How are you doing and how can I help? If couples ask themselves, how are you doing? and how can i help regularly i think it'll go a long way through this epidemic and beyond so as mentioned by shahzad and samreen saath milkar ek dusre ko support karna bahut zaruri hai ek tip ye hai ki do sawal ek dusre ko puchte rehna one aap kaise ho and two main aapki madad kar sakta ya kar sakti hu और दोनों साथ मिलकर ऑर्गेनाइज और प्लान करते रहें, स्पेशली इन द एरियाज ऑफ हाउसवर्क, फाइनेंसेस, 
or child care. So Maureen, during this time, not many people have the space that they used to, physical space as well as social and emotional space. And that's for themselves, their social life, or even their romantic life. How does a couple cope with this? Yeah, I think this is a key question that we need to look at because before this pandemic, right, we would naturally take our space, um, whether it was going to pray, whether it was our hobbies or going to work, we didn't have any restrictions on where we needed to go or what we needed to do. So our space naturally came to us. It was built into our routine. However, however, now we do have to be more intentional in taking that space. So recognize what that space for yourself will look like. And then of course, what that space for your partner will look like. And of course, what that space would look like for both of you as a couple and then a family unit. Right. So whether it is taking out that time within your day to go work out, listening to some music, dancing, painting, cooking, cleaning, whatever it is you need to do, recognize that. And also going back to not assuming what we need or what our partner needs, communicating that to your partner. Right. Um, and in order for you to know what kind of space you need and when you need it, know what stress looks like for you and your partner and communicate that. For some people, their heart starts pounding, they have anxiety-like feelings, they can't breathe properly. Some people tend to withdraw, some people become a little bit more irritable, right? Some people tend to cry, some people get headaches or stomach aches. So know how stress impacts you physically, mentally, emotionally, and have that conversation with your partner about taking that space and what would that look like, right? So we all need a pressure release valve. So kind of like in our instant pots or our pressure cookers, when the pressure builds up so much, we need to ventilate that steam, right? Similarly, we do need that time and space to release some of that pressure. Um, typically what ends up happening is one partner may need more space than the other, and that's totally fine, right? So knowing your personality and your partner's personality, being a little bit more adaptable and flexible, and of course, just recognize that you both are doing the best that you can given this time. So um, a tip here for the couples, I understand not everyone has the bandwidth or capacity every single day to take 15, 20, 30 minutes given all the responsibilities that you have with each other, with your families, with work. So at least once a week, whatever that looks like, take some time, take some space, to re-energize yourself and releasing that pressure that's been built up. So ultimately you can be the best version for yourself, for your partner, and then for your family. That's a really good tip. And I think um, it'll be very useful for couples. Now, many of us are also living in extended families with parents and in-laws, whether or not that was the case before the crisis or is different than what it used to be. So Maureen, can you talk a little bit about how this can become stressful and some strategies to reduce the tensions that may naturally occur in such an environment? Yeah, so first of all, I wanted to highlight what a great opportunity this could be to really connect with our extended family, right? And feel part of something that's larger than ourselves. So really take a moment and recognize that this is a very unique time and you are part of something grand. Um, so it is a great opportunity if we can reframe our mindsets. So whether you were already living with your extended family prior to this pandemic, or you have to take in your loved ones to care for them because of this crisis, just understand this is definitely an ever evolving time. So going back to being adaptable and flexible really helps, right? Um, but we do recognize that living with extended family does bring in with its own challenges, right? So there are lots of cuts in the kitchen. Um, there are different rules, different expectations from everyone. Um, your partner didn't grow up in the same culture or even with the same rules and expectations of closeness and boundaries that you may have. So letting everyone be heard is very critical. However, coming back to the understanding that the couple is the head of the household. So ultimately the couple does need to decide 
the decisions, make those decisions for the family unit, right? So it's important for everyone in the family to be heard, but the couple needs to be ultimately on the same page regarding the big final decisions so they can present a unified front. So ultimately as a tip that you can implement this in your daily lives, as the head of the household, couples should really create a solid routine after hearing everyone in the family that works for all. And of course, allow for some flexibility given these ever-changing times. So, jitna zaruri hai ke sab sab ki baat sune, usse zada zaruri hai and make sure ke couple ek hi page par rahe, phir ja kar phir puri family ko manage kare. So I think at this point, you know, we've talked a lot about the basic foundational strategies to approach this pandemic, but now let's move on to communication between couples and how to strengthen that relationship or bond between them. We always hear that a successful relationship is all about communication and how communication is so important. In fact, you know, um, in CAB as mediators, we're trained about how communication traps can cause so much damage to a relationship. So Shazad, can you talk a little bit about what are some of these communication traps that couples often get into and then some tools to overcome them? Yeah, um, definitely. There's a lot of them, whether we're in COVID times or before COVID times. The first one I would talk about is mind reading and making assumptions instead of asking what your partner is thinking about or how they're feeling about something. A lot of times we try to guess what our partner is thinking and if they give us a look or if they sort of say something short and trail off, we fill in the blanks. So the first thing I would say is before jumping to conclusions, ask your partner what they're thinking. You might say, hey, I just saw you give a look um, wanted to ask you what you are thinking about, or, hey, I missed what you just said um, before you trail it off, tell me more. So instead of making these assumptions, asking your partner what's going on, a lot of times we find that couples will fill in the blank and they might not be the most positive thing. The other thing I would say couples do a lot is not asking for what they want or assuming that the other partner knows or should know what they want. So even couples that have been together 10, 20, 30, 40 years, even those couples do very well when they ask one another for what they need and what they want. Asking does a lot. It makes you, uh, it makes the other person know exactly what you need and it makes other people feel wanted and helpful. So don't assume, ask for what you need and, and invite others to help you. I'll also say a lot of couples tend to keep their appreciation for the other to themselves instead of saying it out loud. So instead of saying, thank you for cooking me such a great meal today or thanks for covering the kids while I was away, they might just express that gratitude inside instead of saying it out loud. Now, what we know about research is that for every five uh, positive interactions, it it's essentially takes five good positive interactions to negate a negative interaction. And healthy couples give five really great positive interactions, whether it's a compliment or, or some gratitude for their partner. So you can think about it like putting um, some money into the bank every time you say something positive. And it makes couples a lot stronger when sometimes we have negative interactions, which is inevitable in every relationship. The last thing I'll say is many of us say things to make our partners feel better, but they sort of do the opposite. Saying things like you shouldn't feel that way or don't worry about it or don't be sad or it'll all get better soon. Oftentimes, even though we want to you know, create this warmth and we want our partners not to feel negatively, they often feel invalidated if we tell them to not worry about it. So instead you could say, tell me more about how you're feeling and open up the conversation. 
and have create that space so that your partner is heard. Now, what we know about the research is that it shows that when people say what they're feeling, I'm sad, I'm scared, I'm nervous, I'm angry, they actually feel less of that feeling they're talking about. So getting your partner to open up and instead of saying, you shouldn't feel that way, saying, tell me more, and having them talk to you about what they're worried about, that'll go a long way. And that's our tip for this section. So, just as Shazad ne kaha, agar aap apne partner se kuch chahate ho, to assume na kare ke aapke partner ko pata hai ke aap kya soch rahe hai. Instead, loves is the mal kar kar apne partner se mang na chahiye aur batao usko ke kya chahiye. I always find um, these tools to be really helpful. So, and I think they do go a long way, just like you said, Shazad. So, you know, Samri and Shazad, I'll ask both of you, what are some more additional tools that you can recommend for couples to communicate more effectively? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I feel like we have so many tools out there, right? Um, when it comes to communication, um, and we can feel, it's easy to feel inundated with all of that information. So a few tangible items that you can take away from here are really, first of all, you need to make time to talk to each other daily. Um, that is critical, making time for each other, prioritizing one another, validates the importance of your partner's time and um, their presence in your life. Second, during that time, share your thoughts and feelings. Um, oftentimes what ends up happening when we share our thoughts and our feelings we can come off as demanding and or criticizing, right? We can come off critical, even though that's really not our intent. Our intent is just to share our feelings with our partner. Um, but when that ends up happening, we naturally put our partner on the defense. So here are some examples of I statements that I feel you could use in your daily lives and your conversations when talking about those important and difficult feelings that, um, won't put your partner on the defense. So for example, um, instead of saying, how many times do I have to ask you to fix that broken stuff? Try reframing it to, hey, honey, I'm worried that someone will trip on that stuff and get hurt. When do you think you'll be able to get to this? So this puts more of a concern and puts your partner in the responsibility of, hey, I need to prioritize this for the sake of my family. Instead of how many times do I have to tell you to do something, right? Another example is um, when your partner shares something and you really don't feel like talking in that moment or validating their feelings, or you just may not understand, it's natural to say, hey, you are not making any sense. Try reframing that to something more compassionate and solution focused. So try saying this, I don't understand what you mean. Are you saying that? So ultimately, you're summarizing and reframing what they're saying, um, and that makes it more of an open-ended conversation, right? And last but not least, instead of saying, don't expect me to clean the house, try reframing it to, hey, honey, when is a good time for us to talk about cleaning this week? So then we can ultimately set up a routine and set up our responsibilities towards that. So a takeaway is really make time for each other regularly, share your thoughts and feelings and share them respectfully in a way that is more conducive to a solution focused outcome by using I statements. I think I'd also add that a lot of times when we listen, we it's really difficult in this day and age to listen with full eye contact, full attention. So I would say, Think about how you're listening. A lot of times we get into this trap of listening without, with, you know, while we're thinking of the answer that we're going to give. And instead, try to put aside whatever answer you're thinking about and summarize asking clarifying questions and checking for understanding. So saying something to your partner like, oh, is this what you mean? Or, oh, I get what you're saying. Is this what you're trying to say and checking for understanding will allow you to really both feel heard i would also say that it's okay if there's some silence and so if there isn't an answer necessarily to have some silence in between the conversation 
to just really communicate you're really listening can go a long way. And then I'll also say that turning off phones and the TV, all distractions so that you have your undivided attention would be good during this time. I'll also try to say that it's really good to have more discussion than fights and to know the difference. So a fight is like saying, you're right, you're wrong, and I'm right. And a discussion is more about understanding your partner's thoughts and feelings and sharing your own. So knowing when you're in a discussion or when you're in a fight can be really helpful because if you're actually in a fight and you're trying to prove that you're right, then it can be a great opportunity to shift gears, check your thinking, and return back to trying to understand where your partner's coming from, transforming that fight back into a discussion. I think that's great, Shazad, because then you're focusing on the problem as the problem, right? And not each other as a problem. So a takeaway here is offering some frequent praise, encouragement, and support to your partner. Um, recognizing when your partner does something good. So if your partner is not likely to do the dishes and they do and they surprise you, then maybe letting them know how grateful you are instead of brushing it off as, hey, this is just a household responsibility and we should both do it. But if it's something out of character for them, recognizing it and that builds positive reinforcement. So constant positive positivity does create a better solution focused household. I can definitely see how some of these um, strategies could make communication more effective. Even in a mediations that we conduct, um, that could be really useful between two parties um, in resolving a conflict. So we've of course heard how communication is key, but let's get into specific ways to enhance and bring warmth to a relationship. So I'll ask both of you this question. What advice do you have for partners on how to communicate their loved, love during this time? It's a great question. There's so many couples that are taking advantage of this time that they may have to grow closer. Um, sometimes stress can make us feel like we need each other more than ever. And what we'd like to talk about is this concept of love languages. Essentially, all couples have this each partner has this way that they like to give love and ways they like to receive love. And if you know the ways that you like to give and receive love, then you can have a much closer relationship. And Summerine will tell you a little bit more about what the different love languages are. That'll help you really understand um, what your love languages are and how they work your relationship yeah indeed this is an awesome question and i love this topic um, the concept of love languages actually originates from gottman institute and his research to shazad's point echoes that there are five love languages that every couple operates out of i'm sorry not every couple every individual operates from so those are words of affirmation gifts acts of service quality time and physical touch. So basically what that means is all of us operate from a foundation of giving and receiving love in these five different languages, right? So words of affirmation essentially mean some of us like to give and receive um, validation about our thoughts, um, our actions. So for example, some like your partner may have taken the trash out and your partner's love language as words of affirmation, they would definitely love to hear, thanks, honey, for taking that trash out. I really appreciated that. Um, that could validate their feelings and that could validate the love that you have for them, right? Um, gifts, some people like giving and receiving gifts. That's their love language, nothing wrong with that. Acts of service, so say your partner's love language is acts of service. What they could do is take your car for an oil change, put in gas in your car, that's an act of service. Or while you're already in bed, maybe bringing you a glass of water, making breakfast for you, that's an act of service. Um, that's another way people can communicate that, hey, I love you, right? Quality time. Some people do love in a way of spending quality time with their partner. Um, that could mean watching a movie together, going for a walk together, cooking, cleaning, 
um, exercising together. So spending quality time is extremely valuable for those of us whose love language in giving and receiving is spending that time with our partners. And then last but not least is physical touch, right? So some people may just wanna hold your hand um, or your, some people may wanna hold their partner's hand or give them a hug, right? They feel comforted, secure, safe when it comes to giving and receiving love. So I'm gonna pause here and let our audience maybe take a screenshot of this. Um, and I think this is a fun activity you all can do with each other after this, have a conversation about what love language looks like for you and what do you prefer um, your partner gives to you? I think those are really great ways of expressing your love and each one individually has their own. But there's also a lot of stressful conversations that are currently happening within couples and um, they seem to lead to conflict and upsetting each other. What approach do you recommend, Shizad, to make these more productive and reduce the hurting each other of the couple in, in between couples yeah there's so many stressful conversations couples are having to have and sacrifices they're having to make and big decisions they're having to make and i think the biggest trap we often get into is not being in the right space to have those conversations a lot of times one partner might want to have it and the other might not be ready to so my advice would be to ask your partner, if they're in a good space to have that conversation, in planning big decisions and big, um, big uh, discussions for times when both partners are ready. A lot of the times one partner is totally caught off guard. And so having the time when both are in a good space and preferably not when you're going to bed. Um, those are some of the worst times to have big decisions or discussions is at night, right before bed or right after a tough or stressful day. The other thing I'll say is it's important that if you're really flustered or anxious or nervous um, and during a discussion, it is completely okay to take a time out, to take a break, and to tell your partner, hey, this is getting me really worried. I don't think I can think straight right now. Can we continue in 10 minutes, in 20 minutes? Sometimes partners actually need to recontinue these discussions the next day. But the important thing is coming back to it, okay? Couples that push things off indefinitely actually create more anxiety and distress. So it's totally fine to take a time out. You should take a time out. But it's important that if you do, to come back to it. The other thing I would say is there might have been a lot of discussions and conversations that really were important before COVID hit and now might not be that important. So if you are trying to make a big financial decision or putting the house up for sale, and perhaps those decisions might not be really important, I would talk to one another to say, hey, maybe we should put this in the back burner and really prioritize big discussions that have to happen right now. The last thing I might say is that this is a really good time for getting outside. And I would advise couples to try having some stressful conversations while walking outside. You kill many birds with one stone. You get a combination of fresh air, there's the benefits of exercise and actually being side by side next to one another instead of face to face could naturally relieve some of the tension. And you're also doing something good for your mental health when you're exercising. So I would say that. And I suppose our tip for couples that I would say is that have one conversation at a time. One stressful conversation is more than enough at a time. But what often happens is one stressful conversation might spur another one and another one and another one. So keep each other accountable on staying on topic and deciding one thing before moving to the, to the next one. So as Shazad mentioned, ek cheez ko mindful rakhna chahiye jab stressful conversations ho rahe ho. 
कि टाइम देखना जरूरी है सोने से पहले अच्छा आइडिया नहीं है क्योंकि अपने सोने पर असर हो सकता है ऑल्सो ये याद रखें कि कोई हर एक चीज डिस्कस करना जरूरी नहीं है अभी प्रायोरिटाइज करें कि कौन से टॉपिक्स अहम है इस टाइम पर और वो डिस्कस करें so i want to go into one specific difficult conversation that is likely taking place between a lot of couples so which is finances um so and the stress that finances is causing right now so samreen how do couples deal with this type of stress specifically yeah so generally speaking this is a difficult conversation right and can become even more challenging during these uncertain times um so it's really critical engaging the right time to have this conversation and right place right so to shazat's point earlier you definitely don't want to have a conversation about your finances before you go to bed um so picking the right time and the right place is key when you're talking about your finances but currently given the unprecedented circumstances there are layoffs there are um lots of folks losing their jobs unfortunately there are pay reductions happening so we have to be mindful that finances although it's a difficult topic it is it has to be at the forefront of your plan of action right so first and foremost you may have to shift your financial priorities um given the changing finances of your family so for example if you were looking to purchase a car but unfortunately one partner may have had a pay reduction or a loss of job or business then you may need to refocus your decision on purchasing that car and maybe need to focus that those finances in part as part of your emergency fund so discussing those financial priorities and prioritizing what's important currently and in the long term is critical um discussing your daily expenses right so that's changing so now your children are home you both are home what do those expenses look like um you may not have child care to pay for but now some things have shifted where you may have to pay more for groceries or other items so focusing on those daily expenses and prioritizing those that's critical as well um also financial values and long term goals right so yes we're talking about our financial priorities currently and our daily expenses which all fall in the short term realm but we have to focus on the long term right so do we need to focus on refinancing our mortgage um do we need to maybe shift some things around for the college budgets that we have for our children um what would it look like if i do end up losing my job will this impact our long term goals and all of this comes in um the form of our financial values right so if you are already not aware of each other's financial values now is an excellent time to have that conversation so one part one partner may value taking trips so they may have set aside some funds for that however another partner may value having the next nice jacket so really having your financial values intact will also really help with shifting your priorities financially um last but not least control what you can right it's extremely easy to ruminate over your financial stressors because that is something that impacts us significantly day in and day out so what i mean when i say control what you can is essentially look at your finances and see what resources you have available right so there are tons and tons of financial institutions that provide webinars for different scenarios whether it's for your savings whether it's for your spending um whatever it is by controlling what you can and taking steps towards that it still makes you proactive as opposed to reactive and prevents you from ruminating those from in those thoughts over and over and over So some tips to take away are know your resources as I mentioned and really really be transparent. So even though you might have been the sole breadwinner of the family, it's still critical for you to be transparent to your partner because it definitely impacts your partner how the finances of the family are, how the couple's finances look like if there was an emergency. So sometimes there are certain conversations that are so stressful, so heavy loaded that they can cause anger to come out within a conversation. So is it that is would you consider anger in a relationship necessarily a bad thing? I wouldn't, but it is a common misconception that anger is bad. 
And I think it's because that when we think of the emotion anger, we often think about the bad ways that anger can be expressed, the ways that actually are quite hurtful. But anger is actually an emotion that is just as valid as any other emotion. Anger is a sign that like all emotions, um, it gives you a sign. It might be a sign that something doesn't feel good, isn't right, or needs to change. It can sometimes indicate that you're hurt or you're scared or you're frustrated or overwhelmed. And it's really important for couples out there to know what your anger is telling you and what might be behind your partner's anger. So remember, anger is that same emotion that gets people to start solving problems or standing up for injustices in the world. Um, so anger can be a really good thing, um, especially in times that are stressful. It's really just how you deal with anger that matters. I would say that if your partner does get upset, frustrated, angry, use this opportunity to think beyond the anger. What, why was this hard for them to hear? What did it trigger inside of them? Was it a part of their history? Are they hurt? Are they scared? If you can understand your partner's anger or your anger, then you have the keys to work through it and become closer as a couple. So essentially doing a root cause analysis and figuring out what is beyond the anger. And that's what I'll give as a tip for our audience. After noticing anger within yourself or within your partner, get into the habit of asking yourself, what is this really about? So as you mentioned, Shazan, zaruri nahi hai ki gusa har waqt bura ho. Gusa ek kisam ki jazbaat hai. Just like other jazbaate or koi situations mein gusa jayez bhi ho sakta hai. Lekin ziyada tar guse ke niche or koi vajay chupi hoti hai. Or us vajay ko janna or address karna bohot zaruri hai. And in fact, I can attest to that, you know, as a cab mediator, we receive um, certified training in dealing with conflicts and um, we use that term a lot, the root cause analysis. I mean, getting to the bottom of really what is causing that anger is, is the way to go. So you can deal with the anger, but can you give us some tips on dealing with that unpredictive, unproductive anger, the kind of anger that makes us explode at um, our partner or say unkind things? Samreen, can you um, answer that question? Yeah, um, so anger can be felt in many different ways, right? So, and in many different places. So we have angry thoughts typically, right? But anger is a physical manifestation of those angry thoughts. So know your physical signs. Um, some people tend to become anxious. Um, some people's hearts are pounding. Your digestion can be impacted. Um, your, some people's blood pressure rises, your head may start burning, your hands may start shaking. Um, so know what those physical signs look like for you. And of course, know what those angry thoughts also look like, right? So although Shazad mentioned, anger could be expressed when compared to passion and um, your goals to something that is changing the world. But typically, unfortunately, our angry thoughts lead, could lead to destruction if we are not aware of our thoughts or those physical signs, right? So it's definitely good to take those anger temperature checks so we can be mindful of catching it before it rises. And then know your anger cue as well as your partner's. So if you're not already aware of yours and your partner's cues, have that conversation, right? That, hey, these are my cues, this is what I've observed in you. So what is it that you need? But this is what I need, right? And then this might even mean you taking that break and your partner needing to accept that, right? Hey, I need to go for a walk. And you may not even be able to vocalize it in that moment. So maybe just stepping outside before it does become destructive. There is another way of uh, managing our anger or really anxiety feelings or anytime you want to feel a sense of calmness. We call this four by four boxed breathing. So I wanted to do this activity with everyone listening and watching at home. So right now, if you can close your eyes 
Or if you're not comfortable with closing your eyes, it's completely all right. Find a place in the room that you can focus on that's relaxing, right? So when you do that, I'm gonna walk you through a breathing pattern. So we're going to inhale for the count of four and exhale for a count of four. We'll pause at the top for a second. So ready? Take a deep breath. Four, three, two, one. Exhale, four, three, two, one. Let's do it one more time. Breathe in. Four, three, two, one. And exhale, four, three, two, one. Such a simple breathing exercise, right? But something you can do with your partner, your children, your extended family, really at any time you feel the temperatures are rising at home, taking that break could really help you reshift your focus on what's important. I, I, I actually love that technique. Thank you, Samreen. And, um, you know, there are people out there who can definitely use it and it works for them. But then there's also um, individuals who end up maybe resorting to or having to end up being caught in a relationship with violence. Shazad, could you share some advice for those couples? Sure, yeah. This is a pretty complicated question and I think it'd be worth defining what violence is. So domestic violence is any kind of behavior used to control or intimidate their partner. It includes physical, sexual, psychological, emotional, and financial control or abuse. Many of those we know what they are, but psychological abuse at least can include intimidation or control or making a partner always feel guilty. Emotional abuse can include name calling, criticism, or undermining constantly partner's self-esteem. And then there's financial abuse, which includes preventing a partner from accessing finances or working or even making financial decisions. So sometimes violence in a relationship is about struggles with managing anger. And we've talked about some tips for anger. Sometimes it's a way to resolve a conflict that's ineffective. And we've talked about conflict resolution and CAB is gonna have a great conflict resolution webinar next week. And sometimes violence can be used as a way of controlling the other person. So for some couples, separation might be best, while for other couples, learning better communication and conflict resolution skills might help. But most importantly, if couples are engaging in violence or are at risk of it, it's most wise to get professional help. And above all, safety for everyone involved should be prioritized, children and adults. So if you feel that you, your safety or the safety of your loved ones is at risk, you can call the National Domestic Violence Hotline, which is an external resource that is very helpful. Thank you for that and keep them coming. But um, I wanna go ahead and start with the first one, go right into it. And um, Shazad, I'll give you this one. So it seems like couples have more and more time together. What are some things that they can take this opportunity to strengthen their bond with one another and their families? It's a good question. Yeah, a lot of couples are taking this time to get closer. Um, you know, the ones I hear about a lot is supporting each other's health goals. I'm a big fan of that. So couples didn't have a lot of time to exercise or eat well before or finding more time to do that. And this has really never been a better time. So getting on track, being each other's cheerleaders and getting outside, we know that the connection between physical health and, and uh, emotional health and, and mental health are so connected. So I would say connect outside, connect over being healthy. I'd also probably say that this is a good time to look at uh, old albums, um, picture albums, <laughs> looking at old pictures, so just find positive ways to reflect on the past. And I'd also like tell couples to remind yourselves how resilient you truly are. I mean, many couples, all couples have been through really difficult times and they've come out stronger. This is the time to reflect that and to share those stories with your families 
Um, and then I'd also probably just say start new traditions and do something to spice it up. You know, start a new hobby, start a new tradition, whether it's listening to music in the morning, having a dance party, um, you know, you know uh, cooking together. This is the time when families are getting really creative and couples can get really creative and lead the charge. So Maureen, I'll give you the next question. Um, stress is felt more when one partner is still working outside the home and the other is at home to deal with kids, in-laws, and all other household responsibilities. And then also dealing with being ignored by your partner when he or she returns back from work. Any suggestions on how to navigate around this issue? Wow, that's definitely an extremely challenging situation that um, I didn't take into account. But yes, there's definitely people who are working outside the home currently. And of course, those are our heroes. And um, those are also the ones who, who need, still need to be outside. So I can understand the level of pressure that may be on that partner, um, but also adding additional partner or pressure on the one who is staying at home now full time with the children, which is very difficult. And you mentioned that there is extended family involved. So going back to some of the communication tips we shared, right? So if one person is going out to work and the other person is full-time working at home with children and dealing with so many other people, you need to find both of you the time every single day to reconnect, right? And of course it can't be right before you go to bed. So not sure what that time looks like for you in your daily activities, but definitely need to find that time to ensure that you are both on the same page and making those decisions together for the entire family as a team, right? So during that time, communicate what your needs are and what your partner's needs are. You both need to have those lines of communications open. And then even for the person who's at home, you still need some space and time, right? And the person who is working outside definitely needs some space. So when you're communicating, talk about what that space looks like you definitely don't want to be around your kids and your in-laws all the time. I understand you also need that time and I'm sure your partner doesn't want to work all the time. So when you're communicating, think of it as a solution focused pro um, approach. So he's not the problem. You're not the problem. The problem is the problem. And in order for you to address that problem, you need to communicate and you need to create the space for both of you to be the best that you can be for each other and your families. Thank you, Samreen. So we talked about difficult conversation and that's what this next question is on. What if the what if one of the partners gets very anxious when we are discussing difficult topics and does not want to discuss further? Shazad, do you want to take that one? Yeah, yeah. That's a really good question. Thank you for whoever asked it. This this happens all the time. I mean, let's face it, there's um really anxious like difficult conversations are really hard and it makes all of us a bit anxious. And if one partner is even more anxious, what I would say is that if both partners can sort of come together to help that person deal with that anxiety in the moment. So if you are, if it's your partner that's anxious, say, hey, what can we do right now to make you feel a little bit better? Tell me what you're nervous about. I, I hear you're, I'm, I'm seeing you're trying to move away. Um, tell me what I can do. What do you need? How can I help you as we're going through this? Um, Shazad, sorry, to add to that response, I wanted to say, um, typically when we're getting triggered, having these difficult conversations, there is a root cause involved, right? There is a deeper issue in, involved. So to your and Marion's point earlier, I think it's important to realize or recognize what that root cause is, right? Why is this partner getting triggered and getting anxious during this difficult conversation? Um, could it be that growing up, this was an issue or this has been an issue that we have not been able to resolve? So recognizing what the root cause is and then working from there could really help the partner who is feeling more anxious for that topic um, feel a little bit more validated. Yeah, and, and also just stress management techniques. Sometimes one partner might really benefit from learning some in the moment ways to, to reduce their anxiety, whether it's breathing throughout, 
and partners can really help themselves um, reduce that tension in the moment or taking a break if needed. Next question. Often each spouse feels that their work is more important than their partners, and they feel like they are burdened with work both at home and professionally, and feel that they do not feel appreciated enough by their spouse. What can we do more in intentional about appreciating our spouse? Samreen, do you want to take that one? Sure. I think this is the fun one. Um, <laughs> if you can reconnect this to some of the conversations we had today. So um, I think for these couples, it would be beneficial if you can take that love languages quiz today, because it sounds like one of you is not feeling like you're doing enough, right? Despite doing so much, you feel inadequate and just not enough. Like no matter what you do, it feels like you're never enough. But maybe it is that your love language is words of affirmation. You just want to hear from your partner, hey, I like what you're doing and I appreciate it. And maybe that's not your partner's love language for giving, right? So maybe their love language is, hey, let me take care of this for him or her. And maybe that's how they'll appreciate it. So trying to figure out how you like to receive love and how your partner likes to give love will probably put you in a better place to recognize, you know, to solve this problem of inadequacy in a relationship. And just to put things into perspective, inadequacy in a relationship could lead to future contempt and resentments. So if you don't have these conversations now and openly, um, they could eventually become a lot more um, critical and just into resentments that will take more to recover from. So focus on the present and focus on what you need to communicate that with empathy and receive that with empathy. Thank you. Um, here's a question. I work from home. I work full time from home. It can be tiring after a long day of work. My partner thinks that I should be immediately available after my work to share in chores, etc. But I need some time to unwind. It creates some conflicts. So any strategies for that, Shazad? That's a really good question. It's actually a question that's as old as time. You know, one partner comes back from work and they're really tired and exhausted and another partner hands them a baby or, or a chore or a task to do and i just want to have a lot of empathy for both people in that situation sometimes partners are just waiting for their partner to come home so they can get some relief and sometimes partners are just waiting to come home so they can finally put their feet up and breathe a little bit i think it's really important for partners to talk about how it's really a difficult time um, when they get home. And I will say that if a plan can be made for some time um, uh, that, the, that a partner that's coming home from work can have, it can be really helpful. But you need to talk about how that would look like. And it's important to, to, to actually really define that. So is it five minutes? Is it 10 minutes? Is it 20 minutes? And coming to a compromise about what that would look like and seeing how you can get that and how you may be able to give that. But talking about that, saying, hey, I really need this time. Can you give that? Do we have it? Or maybe I can just jump in as soon as I get in and then give you 10 minutes and then, then you can give me another 10 minutes. So sometimes spouses do this thing where they come home and they'll take a few deep breaths before they open the door or maybe spend a few extra moments in the car and then they try to relieve their partners for 10 or 15 minutes and their partners know that after that point they can give another 15 minutes for the for the partner coming home so making a plan that works for both of you is important but i do want to empathize for both in that situation it's a really good question but i can definitely see how even just those 10 minutes 15 minutes can make a big difference yeah. so i agree try those out um, Samreen, in the midst of an argument, what are some strategies to de-escalate and make sure the situation does not get out of control? Yeah, so um, so this is essentially conflict management, right? Um, 
in the midst of an argument, there's a lot of emotions involved. And earlier when we were having our conversation, um, we were discussing to reframe arguments into discussions, right? Because an argument is when we're thinking, I'm right and you're wrong. But a discussion is what we're, we're thinking, we're both right, we just need to come to a compromise or a solution that will help us as a couple. So I think this is more of a mindset sh shift as opposed to an actionable item. So I would encourage all couples to think of your, discuss your arguments as discussions and that you're both right, doesn't make the other person wrong, but how do you get to that solution, right? So you want black, he wants white. How do you get to the gray area in the middle? Um, that doesn't mean the black or the white is wrong. It just means it's different, right? But in the middle of an argument, if you do feel things are escalating and things are headed in a more destructive way, then take a break, pause, um, let the other person know, hey, I need to pause. We need to take a break, but always come back and finish this conversation. Find the right time, find the right place, but come back and finish it. Um, I think I read somewhere it said, um, everyone tells you not to go to bed mad, but no one tells you what to do when you get into a fight at 10 o'clock at night, right? So um, try not to bring up these issues late at night when you need to sleep and you need to be fresh in the morning. So find the right time and place after you pause to come back and finish. This is a good question also. Um, Shazad, I'll let you take it. I think my partner is depressed and anxious and could use some help. What should I do? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think the first step would probably be to talk to your partner about whether or not it makes sense to get help. But even before you do that, talk to your partner about how they're feeling what their depression looks like, what their anxiety looks like. Make them know that you care, that you're interested. Learn about what that looks like for them. Talk about what you see and share what you're concerned about. And I think at that point, you can talk to your partner about whether or not it makes sense to get some professional help. Um, we know that depression and anxiety are really common. In fact, there's statistics that say that like a third of us will feel anxious or depressed or struggle with those at some point in our life. So I would encourage partners to talk about how you can get professional help if you're really struggling with anxiety and depression. We have incredible, incredible ways of helping people through um, various mental health options. We have doctors and professionals and I will also say that sometimes it's hard to know where to start. You can easily go to your PCP and say, hi, I wanna talk about my mental health. And that's a really good place. Another really good place is um, going directly to a mental health professional if you need to. But I would say that our institutions are really good um, at telling you, uh, you know, assessing what's going on and telling you what a good place to start would be. And um, with that, I would like to say that we are out of time. Um, I appreciate all of the excellent questions that, are, that came in. And um, thank you so much for attending our webinar. And I'll leave you with this last slide with um, stay home, save lives. Our institutions want to encourage that you continue to social distance and um, stay home and be safe. Thank you, everyone. Yali Madad.